I'm Nicole. I'm a member of the PSL in Washington, DC, and we're producing this show called Bread Riot to combat the isolation right now and to build new skills. Because of government malfeasance and negligence, 30 million people have already lost their jobs. People can't get to the store, food lines are growing longer, and people have to survive. But there are lots of signs that a mass people's fight back is growing. People are resilient, creative, strong, and able to turn adversity into an opportunity. For people who are laid off, working from home, students, or otherwise stuck at home, the PSL has been producing Thursday night live streams, Saturday afternoon live streams, short videos, interviews, and more. And we're now adding this series called Bread Riot to offer an opportunity to do something really new, like learn how to bake. This is a skill that will last a lifetime and bring happiness and nutrition to our family, friends, and coworkers, while giving you something physical to create, which can be so satisfying right now. I'd like to introduce Michelle Witte, a friend of the PSL in DC. She's a progressive journalist and a really smart political thinker. She also bakes a lot. We've had many meaningful political conversations over the years, and I've also been the very happy recipient of some of her baking creations. So here's Michelle. Hi, I'm Michelle. Um, I am really looking forward to baking with all of you in Bread Riot over the next uh, couple weeks, couple months, couple years, however many recipes we find to play with. Um, but before we get started, I thought maybe I would tell you a little bit about why I bake so much and <laughs> why I think you might like baking so much too. Um, I started baking obsessively about three years ago after eating a sandwich every day for lunch for two years and finally getting very tired of the last good loaf I could find in the supermarket, which was Trader Joe's Tuscan Pane. But even that, you get tired of after a while. And I went, I had been on a visit to um, a friend of mine who lives in Denmark and she somehow, despite uh, being involved in a grad school program and still doing as much activist work as she could and having friends and visiting family, casually mentioned how, yeah, she bakes bread like once, once or twice a week. And I just thought, I refuse to buy this lie that we do not have enough time in our lives to have good food and to have good food that was, you know, possibly even made by someone who you love or given to someone who, who you love. Um, and so I came back and started making bread, honestly, just as a way to feel like I was taking back a little aspect of my quality of life. And the reason I got into sourdough is I don't even know. I, if you had asked me three years ago if I liked sourdough bread, I probably would have said no and been like, oh no, I don't want my bread to be sour. I, I like whatever. Um, but I'm also kind of a minimalist and I like to learn how to do things. And so if there's, if there's a way that I can do every single aspect of a process, then I at least want to know how. Like it makes me, it makes me feel empowered. And then I realized that sourdough is not a flavor, it's just a, a natural method of leavening and you can turn it to anything. And that made me very excited. Um, and so now when we are in this very strange and, and frightening moment where um, there's a lot of scarcity, where we haven't seen scarcity, and at the same time we are, um, a lot of us are at home with a lot more time on our hands, I think it is a really good opportunity to try and explore some of these slower life processes that we are so often told um, to not even uh, aspire to because you've got to work 40 hours a week and you've got to commute an hour each way and you've got to do all this and that. <sighs> it doesn't have to be this way. <laughs> we could all have time to make bread. Um, so yeah, so I'm, I'm looking forward to sharing some of that with you. Uh, it is true that sourdough is slow. It does take a long time, but it takes such a long time that I think the process of making sourdough or, or natural leavening comes actually back around full circle to, to giving you a lot of your time back because so much of it is fiddling with something and then putting it away for six hours and fiddling with it again and then putting it into the fridge overnight. So um, in fact, there's a lot of stuff that, that just goes on behind the scenes that you don't have to bother yourself with at all. Pretty cool. There are also a, a lot of uh, bread making accessories that, um, you know, you might want to accumulate as we go on, but that are definitely not necessary. If you've got water and you've got flour and you've got salt, we can make bread for sure. 
and then you know you might end up wanting to get different things like proofing baskets and Dutch ovens and, and all the rest of it but you you don't need more than the basics and uh, and a little bit of time and a little bit of the will to practice and maybe have a have a flop once in a while it's okay we've all done it I still have flops no I don't wow. pretend you didn't hear that I everything I do is perfect all the time <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I think it's going to be a great time. Um, I am looking forward to exploring all this stuff. I have a terrible performance anxiety right now, and I'm afraid everything that I've been doing for years is going to fail, but I will not show you any of those videos. You'll get the good ones. All right, see you soon, guys. Bye. I'm Michelle. Um, I'm really looking forward to baking with all of you. Uh, with Bread Riot, but I wanted to introduce you to somebody before we get started. This is my starter. Right now she is living in a chunky Tostitos salsa jar because that's as good as it has to get. That's fine. Um, her name is Lady. I apologize for that. I don't know what came over me, but we're stuck with it. It's her name. I, I think if we all really try we can move past her terrible name. She smells delicious right now. And there's an awful lot of her right now because I'm about to put her into a loaf of bread. Uh, so that's why. You don't normally need to have a huge jar full of starter like this. But I wanted to tell you how I made her and how you can make your own if you haven't gotten one yet. There's a ton of information online about making your own starter. Uh, I happen to use the process described by King Arthur Flour, which is probably exactly the same as all the other ones. Um, but it calls for starting with a, a cup of flour and a scant cup of water. Mix it together in a little jar, put it on a windowsill, put it somewhere warm, not somewhere hot. Heat is not good for these guys. Uh, but yeah, put it somewhere warm, leave it for 24 hours. When you come back, throw away half of it. Toss on another scant cup of flour, half cup of water, stir it all up, put the cover back on it, put it back on the windowsill, leave it for another 24 hours, do the same process again. You should start to see it around this time, start to get bubbly, start to expand, like uh, it'll grow after you feed it and then it'll start collapsing again. So repeat that process of feeding it a cup of flour and a half cup of water then every 12 hours for a couple of days. And at some point, the starter should start to smell nice and fruity and kind of alcoholic and sweet. It should definitely be, you know, have little bubbles on the surface. It should be rising and falling over a period of hours in its container. And that means it's alive. It's alive and it's ready to do all the work that we want it to do. If it starts to smell gross, uh, and if it starts to change color or anything, just start over, because that means it, it hasn't gotten the balance of yeast that it needs, and it's just full of uh, bacteria. It's gonna be very bad, <laughs> so don't do that. And then also, uh, this process calls for a lot of flour, and then a lot of discard. I suspect that you could probably do this whole thing using half those amounts, right? Using ha half a cup of flour and a quarter cup of water. Certainly, as you go on, you only need to maintain a tiny, tiny amount of starter. I feel very good if I can dump out everything and just use the like bits of starter that are clinging to the side of the jar to add some flour to and, and remix everything up to. One of the, uh, I think, problems that beginners run into is is ending up with these huge vats of starter and then if you're like me you feel really guilty about throwing it away so then you end up with jars and jars of starter in your fridge and like there are ways to use it but you can also not either feel bad all the time and not fill up every jar you own with a sourdough starter if you just try and maintain less of it like here's my this is a child of lady which is I guess just child <laughs> <laughs> um, but I pulled her aside uh, to maybe make up another 11 four. So you only need, you only need this. This is even a lot. You only need is a little tiny drop. So there you go. 
Also, uh, as I said, starters do not like heat. Don't put them in the oven. Heat, heat is the thing that will kill these guys. If you, for example, need to stop baking for a while and walk away, go away for a couple weeks or a month or whatever, just seal them up in a jar and put them in the fridge. They're gonna be fine. They'll be fine for, I mean, at least a month, probably many months. Um, and then when you wanna use them again, take them out, leave them on the counter to warm them up, give them a little feed. It'll take them a couple of days to get back to life and health because they've been, you know, in, in deep freeze, but they will be fine. But if you stick this thing in an oven, if you drop it in boiling water, that kind of stuff is, is bad. So just be careful. All right, uh, let's, uh, let's get started baking, guys. Let's start this bread so I can have some coffee. Uh, I thought we would start with the most Basic sourdough bowl takes four ingredients. It will take you all day, but you don't have to do stuff with it all day. So sourdough, you know, like comes back around to taking so much time that it doesn't actually take much time at all. And the good news is if it ends up a huge failure at the end, you've only spent your whole day on. <laughs> That's not the good news. <laughs> the good news is uh, sourdough is actually really flexible and it doesn't often result in something that's inedible. Might not be Instagram beautiful, but who is really? Okay, sorry, that was a demoralizing start. Honestly, guys, it's going to be fun. I just am really looking forward to a cup of coffee after we get this part going. So, step one. Step one, we're just going to mix the water and the flour, and we are gonna let it sit and start to do some of its work on its own without us. The water will start breaking down the starch in the flour, and we're gonna begin with a really rough, shaggy dough, and then when we come back to it, half hour, hour, 90 minutes later, it's going to be way more elastic and stretchy. And it's gonna feel good to handle, and that's all the gluten getting started, being made, and those things. Okay. So, we're gonna make like a medium hydration loaf, I think. Take my bleached enriched flour, which I would not normally choose to use, but that is what is in the shops these days. I have a tiny bit left over of this, I've never heard of this before, white rye flour. It's cool. So I'm just gonna put in a little bit of this, like 30 grams of this. I like to mix up my different flours. You can put in cornmeal, that's a really good addition. It gives your, makes your loaves like a tiny bit sweet, tiny bit grainy. This is a tiny bit of wheat that I'm tossing in. I would caution you against getting started with all whole wheat loaves because it, it behaves differently in water and uh, it takes a little while to understand the, the feel of how much water the different types of flour can handle. And so what I'm talking about right now is basically for bread flour or all-purpose flour. All right, I've got 500 grams of flour here and I'm gonna add about 375 grams of water, which will be around 75% hydration. It's, it's high but not so high that I think this dough will be difficult to handle. Let me just pour that in there. But I want it to be high enough so that you can actually stretch the dough and feel, you know what, let's take it there. I've done 363, somewhere in the middle. More than 70, less than 80. All right. Just gonna mix it up here. The amount of flour, or sorry, the amount of water you put in, talking about hydration levels, if you take your grams of flour as 100% of the whole, uh, the hydration that is generally easiest to work with is between, say, 70 and 80%. So you'll still get a loaf with a nice soft crumb but the dough won't be so sticky that it sticks to your fingers and uh, it collapses and slides all around the bowl and stuff. 
which we'll see later when we are building tension in it. So that's the hydration that I'm gonna stick with right now. And I have found that slightly lower hydrations with longer rises give you a nice big open crumb. So I might give this one an extra long proof or fermentation today. All right, so phase one, here we go. All shaggy in there. If I pull on it, it's just gonna break apart, see? But when we come back to this, after say an hour and we add our starter, this will have magically transformed into something much more cohesive and stretchy, which is exactly why we're doing this. So I will see you back in about uh, half an hour, 60 minutes, uh, 90 minutes. I mean, you can soak this stuff for hours and hours if you want to, but we'll try to keep things relatively quick today. So I'll give it, I'll give it about an hour. Then we'll come back. We'll add our starter, and we'll leave it alone again. Then we'll add all our salt, and then we'll get into the stretching and folding, which is the most intense manipulation part of making this kind of sourdough. All right, see you in a bit. All right guys, ready to add some starter to our um, water and flour concoction? Yes we are. Has it been an hour? Roughly. <laughs> doesn't matter. Um, but let's take a look at what's happened. Look at that, remember that shaggy mess that we left before? Now look what happens if I pull on it. Ooh, so much stretch. Like your favorite jeans. Except I don't believe in stretchy jeans. I'm a curmudgeon when it comes to jeans. See, that's what we wanted to happen. All right, let's add the starter. Even this out. We are using 500 grams of flour, so we're gonna put in 20% starter, which is 100 grams. Here we go. Looking nice and bubbly, smelling good. Freshly fed starter does not smell as strongly as um, starter that's getting old. <laughs> which I hope is not true of all of us. Ah, oh, guys, I have been by myself in this house for such a long time. Um, but I, I always laugh at my own jokes, right? Because if you don't, who will? Whew, this is... <laughs> it's a weird day. It's a weird day. Cool, all right, we got the starter in there. There we are. Just gonna mix it up with my hands. That is cool. All righty. There we go. Trying to make sure starter, that hungry, hungry starter, gets acquainted with all of the flour mixture we have in here. And now we'll let this um, little introduction unfold for about half an hour before we come back and add the salt. And then after we add the salt, we'll get into the period of stretch and fold. I am gonna do this today for about six hours. So every half hour I am going to come over, stretch out the dough and then cover it and leave it to rest for about six hours. Um, yeah, it does mean you have to stick around your house if you choose to do it this way. And I would definitely say um, get started doing it this way just so you start to understand how your dough develops and, and how it feels. But then in the future, you know, you can do a round or two, go out, come back, uh, do a round or two, go away for a couple of hours. You can do a long fermentation in the fridge. There's a lot of flexibility. But I do think when you're getting started, uh, it does help to become familiar with the way the dough um, evolves and how it starts to feel so that you can know about how long you can walk away and um, what kind of results to expect if that makes sense. Okay, we'll be back, we'll add some salt, and then we'll start stretching and folding. Yeah. So, 
Uh, my guess is that's slightly more salt than it actually calls for, but I like my bread to taste a little salty. So we're gonna sprinkle that in there. Goodbye, Morton. Ah, another thing. I went out, uh, coarse salt is great. It tastes delicious. Here's how big this stuff is. I bought this once when I went to a store and it was the only kind of salt they had. It's lovely, but it's these giant, giant grains. I am here to tell you they will not dissolve in your dough. <laughs> They'll dissolve in water, and there are recipes that we will eventually get to that call for you to um, dissolve the salt in water and then mix it in like water. But uh, as a warning, if you try to mix this stuff into your dough that's already sort of been incorporated, they won't dissolve and you'll just have chunks of salt flying out as you manipulate it. And chunks of salt when you bite into your bread. That's actually not really a bad thing, but if you use only that and try and mix it in, you're just gonna have like flavorless bread with chunks of salt in it. Uh, not the best outcome, though I will say still definitely edible, and if you're, you know, putting cheese and mayonnaise and tomatoes on it and stuff, it's, you know, could be worse. All right, I am just now sort of squeezing, squeezing this sucker to make sure all of that salt gets gets worked through it pretty evenly. And then I am going to cover it, walk away for another half hour, and then we're gonna begin the stretch and folds. Oh, it is interesting working with lower hydrations. Maybe I'll do a big, big fat wet loaf next. Sorry for that banging. It's gonna scare my dog. Can you hear her drinking? It's very cute. She's a good old girl. All right. So, we cover this sucker up and be back in half an hour. Maybe I'll have a new hairstyle. Who knows? I have nothing else to do. Oh, hello. We're back. We're all back together again. Fellows, it is time to stretch and it's time to fold. But Michelle, you're not wearing workout gear. <laughs> no, it's because we're gonna do that to the dough. We're gonna stand stiffly in front of a counter. Don't worry. Probably no sweating, although, you know, it, who knows, maybe it'll warm up. Here's our dough. We've got flour, water, starter, and salt. And now we are ready to mix and mingle. I am gonna grab the top part of this dough, top, it's a circle, it's a blob, but we're gonna pretend there are four sides. So, I'm gonna pull up on the top and stretch it gently as much as I can. Ooh, see, it's even coming out of the bowl. Starting to be able to see through it, which is very cool. That means the gluten is developing. And fold it over itself. Uh, I put some water on my hands because it helps the dough not stick to them, but this is not a make or break issue. Then I'm gonna turn the bowl and I'm just gonna do this four more times. I'll show you the last one, but. So here's side two, stretch, stretch, stretch. Fold it over itself. See if I can give you guys a view here. Now I'm on this side. Oh God, let me prop it up. All right. A good armpit shot here, but see? Stretching it out, folding it over. Now on side four, stretching it out. Starting to stick to the bottom of the pan, or the, the bowl, sorry. Doesn't matter, because it just gives it a little more resistance. And so here's what it looks like. It's still a blob. It's just a sort of folded blob. That's fine, because as, as time goes on, this dough is gonna get uh, tighter and tighter, and more and more cohesive, till actually by the end of this process, it's gonna be a little bit hard to pull the sides away from each other and fold them over, but that's fine. That means the dough has developed and the gluten in it has developed enough so that it will capture and hold on to all those nice little air bubbles that will actually make it rise. So this is the start of a process. It's gonna be about six hours. So I'm gonna come back and do stretch and folds just like this, roughly, roughly, every 30 minutes for, yeah, for about the next six hours. If you're somewhere really hot, this process will go faster. So maybe after four hours or five hours, you'll be done. If it's really cold, 
It could go a long time. You could toss it in the fridge. But um, for now, we'll stick to stick to leaving it on the counter and, and do something you know that has a definite beginning and end. So six hours. I'll check in with you in the middle of this process and we'll see how our dough is developing before we proof it. All right, see you in a bit. All right, guys, it has been about, I'm gonna be honest, it's been about seven hours, meant to do six. Um, I have been stretching and folding this dough approximately every 30 minutes. Might have gone an hour or two um, here and there, but definitely holding together much more and it is perfectly ready to be shaped and put in ye old proofing basket. If you don't have one of these things, uh, never fear, you can always use a napkin inside a colander. Just make sure you really rub a bunch of flour onto that napkin because you don't want the dough to stick. Um, so you, you can't use too much flour in this process is what I will tell you. So I'm gonna put a little flour here on my surface. Turn out this beautiful beast, trying not to pop any of the nice air bubbles inside it as much as I can. There we go. There we go. It's gonna be a little bit of a rough and ready shaping process. Um, because this dough is pretty stiff because it's low hydration. All right, so, oh, can you see? There we go, that's better, isn't it? Move the flour down here. I'm gonna do sort of the same thing I did with the stretch and folds. Just take one side of the dough, fold it on over on itself, and then I'm gonna grab the opposite side, fold it and kind of stitch it together, right? So I'm holding it together so the dough kind of stays in place. And I grab what was the bottom and pull it. I'm gonna do the opposite side and pull it over. I'm just gonna redo this. See there's a little like pointy corner sticking out here. I'm gonna pull that into the center and then I'm gonna pull the opposite pointy corner. Take this last one and then just push the whole blob over. So now on top, I've got a sort of membrane that can build some tension underneath. Now I just start sliding the dough so that it sort of rolls underneath itself. And the idea is to make a nice tight ball. You can start to turn the dough clockwise or counterclockwise and just sort of, again, push it under itself. And it'll get smaller and smaller and you'll start to see these nice, um, air bubbles sort of form on the surface and get top. Let's see, there we go. If you need to put down more flour during this process, go for it again. Um, there's no such thing as too much flour right now. Let me put a little bit more on top. Now, you can start to pull it to the point where that membrane starts breaking. That is about when you wanna stop because you, you don't wanna split that. So here we go, we've got a nice round ball of dough sort of wrinkly and weird looking underneath. I'm gonna drop the pretty side into my proofing basket, which I'm gonna put a little bit of flour in right now. I don't want this to stick. This dough, again, is not, not really very wet, so I'm not that worried about it sticking to the basket. Uh, it'll probably be a little bit stickier on a napkin in a bowl or a colander, so err on the side of caution with your flour. And there, dumped into the basket. Now, I'm gonna cover that with plastic wrap and put it in the refrigerator overnight and we will bake it in the morning. So, I will see you then. All right, guys, pouring rain outside. Um, and my work was bonkers today. So um, this beautiful low-ish hydration loaf that we have been working on sat in the fridge for a very long time. But I will say a long cold proof in the refrigerator is never actually a bad thing. 
So I probably intended to get it out after about 12 hours, out after about 16. Here she is. And I'm gonna just sort of pull her away from the sides of the proofing basket, but it looks like she's not gonna stick at all, which is very cool. So I've had my oven on 500. I've got a pan of water in there to fill it with steam. I'm gonna take this out. Oh my God, that's hot. Watch out for the steam blast to the face if you do the steam pot thing because it is intense. Okay, hot pot over there. I'm gonna put some flour on this so it doesn't stick to my hand. There we go. Uh, if you want, you can always cook your loaf on um, parchment paper. That's totally fine. I used to do that all the time and then I realized actually all I needed was some flour on the bottom. Um, I'm gonna turn this over, over the sink, so I don't get flour all over my floor. And look at that, ready to be cooked. Gonna take my lame, give it a nice slash across the top. See if that will make it form a pretty ear. The lame is getting a little sticky, I might need a new one. All right, dropping it in the Dutch oven now. trying for once to not cover my house in flour, guys. Okay, and I'm gonna stick it in the oven for 30 minutes. Ugh. All right, 30 minutes at 500, and then another 20 minutes or 25 minutes at 450. I don't know why, that's just, it's a fun thing to do. All right, see you on the other side. Let's see what our loaf looks like. It is time to take it out of the oven. I'll stop waving at you one day. Oh, look at this. So pretty. <gasps> look at that baby. Ooh. That's a hot pot. Let's see. Take it out of here. Looks like I finally actually let this one go long enough to get nice and brown. Let's hear if it makes that cool hollow sound. Uh -huh. uh, like a drum. It's pretty cool. Yeah, here we go. Look what we made. It's got an okay ear on it. Could have been wrapped a little bit tighter, but you know, one of these days we'll reach perfection. But um, maybe for today, I'll just settle for pretty and tasty. Right? I hope you guys had um, the rollicking success with your dough. Try to think of something cool to say. That's what I came up with. <laughs> Oh, lucky you. Um, yeah, I, I hope that loaf uh, was great and we'll try some variations on it for the future um, and I will, I'll see you then. Bye. soft in there. Yep, and it's got a nice um, crust on the outside. I think maybe it's good that I forgot about it for like five minutes. <laughs> so, yay, here we go. I hope your bread is great. Um, I hope you enjoy it. I think I'm gonna have a slice of this and then freeze it for later because I don't need to eat the whole thing right now. Uh, yeah, all right, see you for the next one, folks. Bye.